All right. Um, welcome, everybody. I'm Greg Ostrovich. Welcome to the combined uh, Denver and Boulder uh, Java Users Group. Uh, appreciate you coming. Uh, remember, just a reminder, we're always looking for speakers. Uh, if you have any, email Matt Rabel, myself, or Chris Woyna um, about that. Uh, you can go through the Meetup site uh, for that. Uh, just some announcements we always go through before we start with our awesome speaker, uh, Nate Shuda. Um, a housekeeping announcement, if you need to use the restroom, hopefully you can find it in your house. Um, Tech Systems is usually our food sponsor, and we do appreciate their support. Tonight's dinner is sponsored by Your Pantry and Your Fridge. Um, reach out to Andrew Rawson, a Rawson at TechSystems.com, or Courtney at TechSystems.com um, for if you have any inquiries about hiring or staffing uh, in using that particular sponsor, Tech Systems. Uh, JFrog is another sponsor, and they've said that um, they're looking to spread some additional quarantine cheer with their June sweepstakes. Uh, last month, a DJUG attendee was one of the winners. So at the end of June, a JFrog will be drawing two winners from uh, for Nintendo Switch lights uh, from attendees of select meetups in the conferences uh, they're a part of in, in the month. So uh, feel free to scan the QR code or use the bit.ly link in the chat box. And I know um, uh, Mike Zueto is going to pop that in for us uh, so that you'll have that to register for that uh, drawing. Um, Apex Systems um, Apex Systems is another sponsor. They're usually our beer sponsor. Uh, Braden Colip is with them. Be sure and check their website uh, for your staffing needs as well. We appreciate their sponsorship. Uh, tonight's beers are sponsored by whatever's in your fridge. Um, Develop Intelligence, another awesome sponsor. Uh, they usually give us uh, plural site training to give away. Um, and they are currently looking to hire technical instructors who specialize in several technologies for contract opportunities. Those include Java, Golang, JavaScript, React, DevOps tools like Kubernetes and Docker, and many others. Uh, reach out to Jarrett, J-E-R-E-T, at developintelligence.com if you're interested in that, or contact Bob Clary, as the slide mentions. Um, Amazon is another sponsor, uh, Chris Almond or Sam Ayer. They're hiring all sorts of stuff, all different stacks. Reach out to them um, if you're interested, and there's the slide for Amazon. Okta is our sponsor for the Meetup site. Um, and for this online meeting, and we really appreciate that. Uh, so reach out to them uh, if you have uh, some needs for their uh, their tool sets. Another sponsor is NextGen. Uh, that's uh, Beth uh, Crowley and Sandy Holskin, and uh, beth.crowley at nextgeninc.com. They are currently hiring a senior Java developer and full, a full stack developer. They're also looking for a senior Java developer part-time uh, days, evenings, and weekends. And you can reach out to them at nextgeninc.com. Another uh, sponsor is Agile Learner. Um, that's uh, Venkat's company, uh, Venkat's Romanian. And uh, you can reach out to them at agilelearner.com. We appreciate their support. Uh, they put the conference they had on hold, but they're uh, re retooling and getting ready to do something again for that. Uh, JetBrains is another sponsor. We give away a free, two free IDEs usually. And we are going to try to do some giveaways tonight. I think Mike uh, Zueto, who handles that for us, is going to look um, in the chat to see who's there and just try to pick somebody at random for some of the stuff that we're giving away. Uh, a final thanks uh, before I bring up uh, my counterpart for the Boulder Jug. Uh, thanks to Matt Rabel, who does all the stuff for the streaming, book speakers, and uh, is just amazing and awesome, and we appreciate him. Uh, to Mike Zueto, who does all the stuff around the door prizes. Again, great, and so appreciate his support. And Zeddy Chinfong, who also awesome and amazing and does all the stuff around the social media announcements and, and helps run our operations. So we're all volunteer, and I really appreciate their support to, to make this happen. So with that, I'm going to bring up uh, Chris Woyna from the Boulder Java Users Group uh, to thank their sponsors, and then I'll bring it back and introduce the talk and the speaker. Thanks, Greg. We really appreciate the uh, synergies of being able to combine our meetings together like this. Um, a lot of overlap. Uh, a huge thanks to Tech Systems, Anastasia Alexenko. Uh, she's really an awesome person. Um, she was actually just uh, helping a friend of mine who's a Naval Academy graduate. 
If you have any questions about the industry, um, contact Anastasia at Tech Systems or contact me and I'll put you in touch with her. Um, rule four, cybersecurity. Um, their uh, Colorado Technology Association uh, 2019 winner last year. Um, Jay Zimmerman, no fluff, just stuff. Uh, huge uh, education resource and conferences. Agile developer, Venkat Subramanian. Um, lots of good online video resources, and he's expanding that. Uh, Jet Brains and O'Reilly Books. Back to you, Greg. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. So uh, tonight's presentation is uh, Nate Shuda, uh, thinking architecturally uh, a little bit about the presentation. Uh, Rich Hickey once said, programmers know the benefits of everything and the trade-offs of nothing, an approach that can lead a project down a path of frustrated developers and unhappy customers. As architects, though, we must consider the trade-offs of every new library, language, pattern, or approach and quickly make decisions, often with incomplete information. How should we think about the inevitable technology choices we have to make on a project? How do we balance competing agendas? How do we keep our team happy and excited without chasing every new thing that someone finds on the interwebs? As architects, it is our responsibility to effectively guide our teams on the technology journey. In this talk, Nate will outline the importance of trade-offs, how we can analyze new technologies, and how we can effectively capture the inevitable architectural decisions we make. Uh, Nate will also explore the value of fitness functions as a way of ensuring the decisions we make are actually reflected in the code base. Um, and a little bit about Nate. Uh, Nate Shuda is a software architect uh, focused on cloud computing and building usable applications. He's a proponent of polyglot programming, and Nate has written multiple books, appeared in various videos, and speaks regularly at conferences worldwide. No fluff, just stuff. Symposia, meetups, universities, and user groups. In addition to his day job, Nate is an adjunct professor at the University of Minnesota, where he teaches students to embrace dynamic languages. In an effort to rid the world of bad presentations, Nate co-authored the book, presentation patterns with Neil Ford and Matthew McCulloch. And shout out to that book. I did the tech edit for it and it's an awesome book. If you haven't seen it, go check it out and it's got some really great advice. So uh, that's my two bits on that. So you can find Nate at, uh, at NT Shuta, S-C-H-U-T-T-A on Twitter. And uh, without further ado, uh, let's bring up our speaker, uh, Nate on architecturally on, on our topic. Thank you, Nate. Awesome. Well, thank you, sir. I appreciate that introduction and thanks for having me here today. Good after, good evening. It's evening, right? Uh, I mean, I, I will admit I, I had a little minor freak out. I was, I had ordered dinner because my wife had a virtual happy hour. And so I was responsible for dinner, which means I ordered it because God knows no one wants to eat my cooking. And I looked at my watch and went, wait, the meetup starts at 530, right? And then I went, oh, wait, no, that's that's different time zones. You'd think by now I'd have time zones figured out, but not so much. So I, I do have a couple of things I want to mention. We obviously have been doing a lot of virtual stuff these days. And I work for VMware. Well, we work for Pivotal. We got bought by VMware end of last year. And so some of you probably seen our spring one tour events, you know, where we go around 20-ish cities. Well, obviously, we're not doing that, but we have a virtual variant of that that we just kicked off last month. I started it with Jakob on my team. We've got Cora coming up later this month talking about CI, CD, and Kubernetes and, and how that mixes together. I don't remember who's on for July. I think it's Josh talking about Reactive Spring. And then August, it should be Spencer talking about sort of... Uh, microservices in spring, spring.next, things of that nature. We're also doing this Tanzu Tuesday, which is a recurring event every Tuesday. Imagine that. Uh, we stream it on Twitch and they run the gamut. You know, I've, I've did one earlier this year. Paul did one with Helm. Mario did one on reactive testing. Mark did something on distributed systems. You know, Josh kicked us off with reactive, you know, I think yesterday was Spencer talking about reactive architectures. We got Dave coming up next week, the, the good doctor himself. So it's just a, another way of, of kind of trying to get out there and connect with the community. So, you know, feel free to, to drop in on any of those if you are so inclined. 
But let me get my slides going here, see what kind of trouble this gets us into. Now, I've thought a lot about this whole architectural space. I've been in the, the role, a title, I don't know, at least a decade, something like that. I, I probably did the job a lot longer than I actually had the title. I think that's fairly common for a lot of us. But if you're interested in what I say today and you want to see it in a prose format, I did take the time to write this out in one of these little report-like things that a lot of us have put together recently. So you can feel free to grab this. If you've got an O'Reilly subscription, you can get it on there too. But it's it's the prose variant of this presentation. So you'll, you'll hear a lot of the same messages, big shock there. Now, the first thing that I noticed when I got into this whole architecting thing is, is it's a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. And some of it I sort of knew going into it, but it really doesn't hit you until it becomes real. You know, you, you know that you're going to have to deal with politics and competing agendas, but you're, you're front and center on the technology change in your organization. And you realize very quickly that it changes all the time. When I first got into this industry, I didn't fully appreciate that. And I, I missed some wave or another, it doesn't matter which one. And I felt really bad because I thought, oh no, that was my one chance to get in on the ground floor. How naive I was. Once you've been in, in software for a while, you realize that new technologies are like a bus, a new one comes along every 10 or 15 minutes. So just be patient. And with experience, you start to see the patterns and the cycles and how things tend to repeat themselves. And you can start to recognize how, oh, this thing is like that thing we used to do. And I didn't like it back then. So I'm not even going to bother with this. I'm just going to let that go by. Now, frankly, I love this about our industry. I think it's a feature, not a bug. It's what keeps this interesting. It's what keeps us refreshed. I was talking with Greg earlier about golf. One big positive for me of the fact that I'm not on the road, I'm not traveling as much as I, I would. Well, I'm not traveling at all. I think last time I left the house was February. My wife actually made this comment to me. We were going for a walk about six weeks ago. She said, you know, this is the longest contiguous time you've been home. And, and I think she's right, you know, because since our son was born, because I think that was roughly when I started getting into the whole conference thing. And this is the first time in, in my like 13, 14 years that I haven't had the sort of constant stream of events. But one huge positive for me is I get to spend more time at my golf course, which is awesome. And so a few years ago, I was golfing with one of my buddies and he's a little older than me. And he said, you know, Nate, don't you think you're at the point in your career where you should get into management? And I was like, John, why would I want to do that? You know, I don't want to be a people manager. That doesn't sound like any fun at all. And he says, well, you know, when I was your age, you know, I could do my job cold. It was boring. You know, it just wasn't interesting anymore. And then I got into management. It really revitalized my career and I could help people grow. And it was just, it was really a good step for me. You know, you should think about it. And, and I've reflected upon his comments and actually he and I have discussed this since. I've never felt like I could do my job cold because it's never been the same job. It's always changing. There's always something new. You know, I was talking with Neil about this earlier today. Kubernetes didn't even exist, what, five years ago, six years ago, whatever it was. And, and now that's what's got a lot of people's attention. Well, five years from now, it's going to be something else. And to me, that's part of what makes this industry really fun. It's also kind of tiring because we're sort of constantly throwing away knowledge and learning new things. The challenge for us as senior technologists, you know, we all have different titles. Titles are all over the place in organizations. We want to avoid legacy platforms. We don't want to be the last company on that burning platform. But I have to balance that against the reality that I can't change every few months just because something new comes out. Because there will always be something new. Always. I was talking with someone last summer and she said to me, hey, my application has four different UI frameworks baked into it now. And I totally understand how this happens. You add the second one because the first one isn't quite getting the job done. It's, it's missing certain features. You need to add something. And, and it makes sense. You know, maybe in your head, you're like, yeah, we're going to migrate to this new thing. Well, then somebody else is like, ah, but I just read about this on Twitter. I want to add this in. And then somebody else reads about something else and they want to add it in. The challenge here is somebody has to put up their hands and say, stop. The second one might be acceptable, but the third one and the fourth one, that's at the point we should be flipping some tables here. Now, I get it because as developers, we always want to be putting new stuff on a resume. We have to be very cautious that we're not practicing resume-driven development. And so how do we avoid that? Well, in the same breath, recognizing that evaluating a new technology is something you're going to have to do again and again and again throughout your career. You know, I, I've lost track of how many times that I've been asked to do this or done it on my own just for my intellectual edification. 
But here's the little secret that I want to let you all in on. I don't know what's coming next. I wish I had that crystal ball. I wish I could tell you what the next language framework platform is going to be. If, if I had that crystal clear vision of the future, I would use that technique to, you know, place some bets on a sporting event or, you know, figure out how to make my stock portfolio worth more. The reality is none of us knows what the future holds, but I can guarantee you this much. It's probably going to be different than what we use today. And there's a pretty good chance five years from now, we're going to be using something that isn't even on our radar screen now. It hasn't even been created yet. So the first thing we need to be very aware of as technologists is the fact that it's tempting. It's easy to get into this game of always chasing new things. And again, this is obvious to anybody who's been in our industry for more than about five minutes. It's a constant thing. It's very, very tempting for all of us to get sort of sucked into this. I want to play with the new hotness. It's sort of that proverbial Christmas morning. Oh, here's the new toys. And then we just want to play with the box. What's interesting to me is how many of us actively want to be on the bleeding edge which is surprising to me because the, the title is bleeding edge. It's not have a great experience and everything's going to work as expected edge. And, and I've reflected upon this, like what other places in your life are you actively seeking out the bleeding edge? No one's ever done this before approach. You know, I, the analogy I like to use is I, I had my hip replaced last year. And when I met with my surgeon, if the first time I ever met him, if, if he had said to me, oh, Nate, I'm so glad you're here. Listen, I was just on Twitter and I was reading about this new experimental technique. Could I do it to you? My answer would be no. I, I want the thing you've done thousands and thousands of times. Yeah, the, the, the funny thing to me, you know, at least in retrospect, at, at one point in my pre-op visit, he could tell I was kind of nervous. First time I've ever had major surgery like that. You know, I think before that, the only thing I'd ever had done was like my wisdom teeth removed or something. And, and he could tell I was anxious. And he looked at me and he said, Nate, this is like falling off a log for me. I do this five to 10 times a day, every day. I'm like, okay, all right, that makes me feel better. So it's interesting to me that as technologists, we always want to be on the bleeding edge, but in almost every other part of our lives, we don't want that. Now I get it, it's fun. And it's an important part of being in this industry. We could have a very fascinating discussion about hiring. I think the way we hire is kind of messed up. You know, we have the sort of checklist view of hiring. I don't think that's the best way to do it. I love this tweet because it's a good reminder that the most important part of this is your ability to learn new things. This is the best question to ask somebody in a job interview. Tell me how you learn something. Tell me how here's something you've never used before. How do you figure it out? What's your process look like? Because it's always going to be something new. It's always going to be something different. I, I, I have a computer science undergraduate degree. I was taught C++. I've never written a line of C++ in anger on a project. You know, I, I didn't learn Java in school. I picked it up on the job. You know, so to me, that's the important part of this is you have to be able to pick up new things. You have to be able to learn. Now, I think it's important to realize that education doesn't ever really finish. This is actually a conversation I've had with my son on multiple occasions. You know, he's 13 now. It's been very interesting doing the whole homeschooling thing with him. Although he's at a great age because we can pretty much just say, go do your stuff. And we don't really have to do a lot of handholding. Be a lot harder, I think, if he was, you know, eight or something like that, where we had to try to be teachers. I think that would be challenging. But it, it's important to understand that your understanding of things goes through this constant evolution. And I love this Ben Evans thread because it really nails this. And, and there's things that, you know, what other opinion, people's opinions are, and there's things that you have a strong opinion on, and there's things where you just don't have any opinion at all. And of course, in technology, things are constantly moving in and out of these buckets. There's things that you used to be an expert on, but you're not really following it anymore. And there's things you're just starting to pick up and play with. And there's other things you're an absolute expert on. You know, I used to do a lot of front end work. That was probably where I lived for the first at least half of my career. I haven't done a lot of that development work in at least five years now. So if you were to ask me, Nate, which JavaScript framework should I use on my next project? I don't really have a great answer for you because I've only played around with React and Angular. I've never used them on a real production system. So I can't give you any, any real insightful you know, view on this. I can tell you what some other people's opinions are. You know, I can tell you how it you know, clearly broke Scott Davis at one point. But this is part of being in this industry. And I don't think there's too many industries that throw away knowledge at quite the clip we do. And so it's important to realize that your understanding is always on this continuum and just sort of embrace that fact. Now, to be clear, developers have opinions and they're often very strong opinions. Does anyone care to debate tabs versus spaces with me tonight? I don't know how many of you watch Silicon Valley. I'm a big fan. My wife and I were watching this uh, this 
I'm sure all of you remember the episode where he breaks up with this woman over tabs versus spaces. And I about fell off the couch laughing. I thought this was so hilarious. My wife just did not quite get it. She just sort of stared at me. She's a business analyst. So we have some fascinating conversations. She likes to joke that her job is to tell people like me what to do. And then I like to respond, honey, I'm an architect. I just do whatever I want. I take what you give me and then go build a system that's more convenient for me. She didn't like that answer. But I attempted to explain to her why tabs versus spaces were funny and it didn't get any funnier for her. And so it's important to understand that we do have strong opinions. Sometimes they're not grounded in a whole lot other than but that's just the way it should be. I get that. What's interesting to me is how often a developer will come to me and say, Nate, I have to use this technology and I'll ask why. And they repeat the name of the technology to me. That's not enough. It's very important to understand there's a big difference between knowing the name of something and knowing something. It's easy just to repeat the name. We have to dig into why is this useful to us? At least part of this is a healthy fear of old things. I think every one of us at some point in our career, somebody takes us under their wing and basically says, hey, don't have a legacy skill set. Always make sure your skill set's up to date so that if you want or need a new job, you've got a good up to date skill set. Now, the interesting thing here is you can actually make really good money and have a heck of a career being on the trailing end of a technology as long as you know when to jump, when that technology is definitely over. My favorite example of this was from early in my career. I was working with this guy who had the retirement countdown calculator going as a screensaver. And I didn't fully appreciate this at the time because it was like a four digit number. And so I, I was you know, really surprised he was keeping track of it. Now that I realize I'm close-ish, I guess, to retirement, I mean, it's within sight. I understand why he was keeping track. I'm not ready for a countdown calculator to be clear. It would just be a depressing number. So when, it, when his screensaver got to zero, we had his Bon Voyage party a few days later, not a surprise. But I ran into him in the building probably six months after that, and I was really surprised. So I said, you know, hey, Dick, what, what are you doing here today? Did you come in to have lunch with somebody? And he said, oh, Nate, it's the darndest thing. I'm working three days a week, and they're paying me more than when I was a full-time guy. I thought, well, how do I get this gig? I want to be paid more to, to work less. This sounds like a good idea. The reality is he had a legacy skill set. He knew COBOL and DB2 and Talon and JCL, and he knew where all the skeletons were buried because he put most of them in the code base. And so he took this old skill set and turn it into a very nice contract. So we sh I think sometimes get a little irrational about the old. And we need to be able to distinguish between burning platform that's no longer supported and something that's just been around for a while. I love this tweet. It's something I'm sure all of us grapple with at some point. I'm wary of all these new things. I'm the grumpy fellow in the back who says, isn't that just like SQL queries from the front end like PHP? Is this what it means to be a senior developer? And I think there's some truth to that. I really do. Part of experience is you hear the echoes of the past and you start to hear how this is like this thing we used to do. You know, you can make an argument that microservices is just the evolution of SOA, which was the evolution of EJB, which was the evolution of Corba. And you can trace all these things back in time to see what they used to be. Now we hopefully get better at it. We come up with new abstractions, things get easier, simpler, more reliable, et cetera. But they're not that radically different from what we've done before. Now, I love this thread because it's, again, a reminder of the fact that we have this tendency to ignore the old. We always think the old is arcane and complex, while the new is always simple and elegant. And of course, the reality is most of the time, the new is unfinished, buggy, and unproven, and the old is refined and stable and tested. You know, so my favorite example of this is JUnit. I don't know how old JUnit is, but I'm quite certain it can legally drink in any country on the planet. So if you came to me on your next Java project and said, oh, Nate, we're not going to use JUnit. And I said, oh, okay, why? And you said, well, because JUnit's old. I, I have some concerns with that. What, what's that got to do with it? Now, if you came to me and said, Nate, we want to use something else because it lets us do things that JUnit can't, Okay, that's that's a legitimate way of approaching this. But it's unfortunate that we have this tendency in this industry to always say, ah, once something gets past a certain age, it obviously must be garbage. Let's get rid of it. What truly happens in a lot of situations is things get better. They get more refined. They get more stable. They get more tested. That's a good thing for us. Now, I have noticed there's a very predictable hype cycle in our industry. And luckily for me, my friend and colleague Cote tweeted this out a couple of years ago. And so I immediately stole it. Year one, oh my God, this technology is amazing. Year two, actually, it's pretty hard to use, am I right? 
Year three, you should never use this, especially if you're just trying to put like a friend in on a relational database. Ooh, look, something else shiny and new. Rinse, repeat. Now, I only quibble with this, and I've told Kote this, is the label shouldn't be years. They should be like weeks, maybe months. Because I've seen this again and again and again and again in this industry. Now, I would argue the biggest challenge for us as technologists is not figuring out where to use a technology. We're really good at justifying where to use a technology. We need to be spending a little more time thinking about where not to use a technology. And of course, the reality here is the way we typically learn is through trial and error. And we don't always think about it that way, but but this is this is what we're doing. You know, I, I was talking to somebody about this last year, and they had a really good point. You know, most of you, if you have children, you know, back when they used to go to school, they'd come home from school and you'd ask them, hey, how was your day? What did you do at school today? And most kids would give you a monosyllabic answer, maybe just a grunt. You know, that's usually what my son would say to me. I, I still ask him, even though he, you know, quote unquote, went to school in, in his room. But someone explained to me that that our children aren't, trying to be obtuse or flippant with their responses they've spent the day failing that's what learning is you know my, my son occasionally will complain about something in school math or whatever and i looked, looked at him one day and i said everett if you already knew how to do this we would just give you something harder to do you know there, there's no point in teaching you something you already know so if you already knew how to do this we just give you something harder until you failed at that and then we teach you that you know that's the nature of the beast now, I've, I've thought a lot about this in terms of, of construction. You know, our industry loves to borrow from construction. I mean, the term architect, we stole that, you know, straight up. But think about the house you're in, the apartment building, whatever you are right now, the building you're in right now. We have taken the trial and error of building buildings and we've written it down, we've codified it. They're called building codes. You know, I'm going to go on a limb and say, when we started building buildings a couple millennia ago, we weren't very good at it. You know, they fell down a lot. Someone told me that bridge builders had to sleep on the bridge for a period of time just to sort of certify it. That was like the final QA pass is you have to live on the bridge because the bridge falls down, you'll die. You know, imagine if we had to do that with our software. But the reality is we've learned a lot in thousands of years of building stuff and we've written it down, we get better at it. Software hasn't been around that long. We've been doing this for what, a human generation or so? And, and I always like to remind people that we are typically building something no one has ever built before with tools that we just created. And then people are stunned that we don't know exactly when this is gonna be ready. I mean, imagine that. So software is, is not immune to this. This is how we figure things out. And the best way I can explain it to you is by showing you a Calvin and Hobbes cartoon. I love Calvin and Hobbes. This was foundational for me as I grew up. And so I was delighted when my son discovered Calvin. This is probably, oh God, almost eight years ago now. It's crazy how long, how quickly time flies. And so I've reread every Calvin and Hobbes cartoon with my son now 40, 50, 60 times. And there's one that proves to me Watterson was a software engineer. He just didn't know it. And it's this one right here. It's one of my all-time favorites. How do they know the load limit on bridges, Dad? Well, they just drive bigger and bigger trucks over the bridge until the bridge breaks. Then they weigh the last truck and rebuild the bridge. Huh. Yeah, checks out. We do the same thing. Is Mongo a good choice for this project? I have no idea. Let's try it and find out. Can our application support 50,000 concurrent users? I have no idea. Let's try it and find out. Now, I have noticed that people in our industry tend to have short attention spans. And I don't know what's cause and effect here. I don't know if we get into this industry because we have short attention spans or being in this industry gives you a short attention span. I don't know that it really matters. But we tend to kind of be like dogs chasing squirrels. It's like, ooh, ooh, blockchain. Oh, machine learning. Oh, uh, augmented reality. And then we just run after that. And we have to be very cautious here. Because again, while the learning keeps it fresh, keeps it interesting, keeps us invigorated, at some point, you got to get code to production. You got to deliver business value. And I cannot do that if I'm always experimenting. At some point, I have to say, this is what we're doing. We're going to commit to this. We're going to get good at it. We're going to develop some expertise. You know, think about something that you're an expert on, something that you can do really well. My favorite example is tying shoes. Everybody on this call knows how to tie a shoe. But if I actually asked you, how do you do it? You'd struggle. You'd probably just do some kind of weird hand gesture. If I actually asked you to describe it to me, it would be hard. You have tied your shoes thousands and thousands and thousands of times. It's muscle memory. I still remember the feeling I had the first time I successfully tied my shoes. I don't remember how old it was. I, I couldn't tell you anything else about it, but I remember that feeling of accomplishment. 
So you can't get good at something you only do once or twice. You know, golf's a perfect example of this. You want to get good at golf, you got to put in the hours. You got to hit a lot of balls. Another conversation I've had with my kid. It's important to understand that bleeding edge implies you're going to bleed. This is not, you know, clever sloganeering. It's just the way it is. And so if you're going to use bleeding edge technology, you need to expect a certain amount of pain. I was talking to somebody last summer about this. They were complaining about some technology. And I said, well, hang on, when did you start working with it? And he said, well, I don't know, four or five months ago. I said, well, you do realize it just went 1-0 two weeks back. What did you expect was going to happen when you're working with a point whatever piece of software? Now, of course, the other side of this coin is when people break stuff that works. This actually happened to me last year with my grad students. I had to nuke and pave my personal blog because I had updated something and didn't realize how far out of date I actually was, you know, bad developer. And I had to start over. I couldn't beat my old blog into shape in any way, shape or form. So I nuked and paved. So we've all had this experience. It's part of the reason why we do have a tendency to kick the can down the street on currency, unfortunately. My favorite thing to say about this, you know, how do you know who the pioneers are? Well, they're the ones with the arrows in their backs. We have to expect a certain amount of that if we're going to try to be bleeding edge technologists. And it's important that we go into this with our eyes open and that we think about it strategically because, yes, we need to avoid dead platforms. That's critical. But I can't constantly change direction. I can't be a little technology hummingbird flitting from thing to thing. You know, that way lies madness. So we need to think about this strategically. Now, anytime I bring up strategy, I always have to mention that hope is not, in fact, a strategy. The best thing I can say about hope is it's what rebellions are built on. And while that might be fine for a major film franchise, we need to be deliberate. And one of the hardest things in our industry is the fact that there are a lot of bits out there. Every time I turn around, there's a new language, there's a new technique, there's a new approach. You know, and the challenge for us is how do you keep up? Now, to a certain extent, I'm preaching to the choir here because you folks are spending some of your evening with me, and I do greatly appreciate that, by the way. So depending on your learning style, you know, maybe you're into blogs, maybe, you know, you follow a bunch of people on Twitter, you know, you listen to podcasts, you go to conferences, you know, whatever whatever floats your boat. But it's important to remember something that, that an early manager of mine told me once. I was having this conversation with her, and I said, hey, you know, Mary, why did you get into the management side of the house? Why did you stop being a technologist. And she said, well, Nate, I got tired of having to constantly learn new things. I got tired of being on the technology merry-go-round. And I did not understand it at the time. I totally get it now. Totally get it. And so the challenge for us is making this a habit. It has to be part of your routine. And so don't be afraid to actually block out time on your calendar to do it. You know, I'm lucky that I don't have a ton of meetings in my current current role. When I was, I guess, I don't know, busier is the wrong word because God knows I'm busy, but I don't have a lot of standing meetings anymore, thank the maker. I used to leave blocks on my calendar so I'd have time to think. Because otherwise, you don't ever have an opportunity to play with new things. So I've always been a fan of blocking out Friday afternoon. I'm very much of the opinion anyone who schedules a meeting with you on Friday afternoon has committed a hostile act. You know, I live in Minnesota. The weather the next few days is going to be absolutely gorgeous. You know, I, I obviously, we're not in our offices. You know, everybody's working from home. But boy, if there's anybody that hasn't checked out, you know, after lunch on Friday, you know, they're missing out because the weather is just going to be too nice to, to afford to, you know, to not afford to get out and enjoy it. Although ironically enough, I had a, a team, uh, one of my first teams that I was on when I joined Pivotal, where our team meeting was actually Friday afternoon, which I thought was strange. Our, our manager's sort of explanation was, it's the only time you're not on airplanes. I thought, oh, okay, I guess that's fair. Yeah, so maybe Friday afternoon is a weird spot for you. Maybe it's Tuesday over lunch. Maybe it's Monday morning. I don't know. Whatever fits for you. But I'm also a huge believer in morning coffee. And this is something I've done throughout my career. I never referred to it this way until I was having a conversation with actually Mark Richards about it. And he gave me this as a term. And I thought, ah, I'm launching onto that. And, and basically what it says is you take that first 15, 20, 30 minutes in the morning with your coffee, your tea, your energy drink, your sparkling water, whatever makes you happy. And you peruse the news whatever that means for you. But you do it first thing in the morning before the day gets away from you because if you wait for contact with the enemy to happen, it all blows up. You know, every one of us has had that experience. You know, you got your priority list in your head. And you're like, oh, today's going to be a good day. I'm going to get to one, two, and three on my list and then boom, blow it happens. And, you know, you're struggling at the end of the day to keep your eyes open and you're like, man, what happened? Well, you know, stuff. 
So be very cautious or do it in the morning. And, and it could be whatever makes you happy. It can be Reddit. It can be Twitter. It can be InfoQ. You know, it does not matter. It's what's important to you. And, and I also like to remind people that whatever you're studying, it doesn't have to be a permanent decision. You know, you pick something that you're passionate about, that you're interested in, or that you want to learn more about, and just immerse yourself in that for a couple of weeks, a couple of months, and then go ahead and switch into something else. You know, they're, they're, these aren't lifetime decisions. You know, I'm fairly confident there's only two decisions you can ever make in your entire life that are permanent. Every other one can be changed. Some at great cost, both emotionally, personally, financially, but you know, pretty much any other cho uh, choice can be changed. The most important thing I can tell you in this entire time we spend together is this line right here. Attention is precious. Your attention is the most precious resource you have. And as my friend Michael Nygaard pointed out, it is a resource. It does not scale. He is 1,000% correct here. It'd be nice if you could get more attention. It'd be nice if you could find a way to do it. That's just not how it works. You know, Attention's a bit like real estate. They're not making any more of it. Unlike real estate, though, the value of your attention keeps going up. This is you know, not a new quote, but I love this one. It's, it's a good reminder that, that our attention is something that gets monetized. There are multiple billion-dollar corporations that are around to capture and monetize our attention. You know, I... I I like to joke that those cat videos won't watch themselves. You know, I'm pretty sure at this point, that's the internet. It's just like cat videos all the way down. I saw the most meta thing. The, this was a couple of months ago. It was uh, people who said they wouldn't get cats and now they have cats. And so this, this woman took a photo of her dad with this cat and said, oh, my dad hates cats. Now he's got a cat. And he was showing the cat cat videos. And the cat was just like staring, like fully intent upon his, his uh, tablet. I thought... That's pretty darn meta, like, you know, cats watching cats all the way down. Do not waste your attention. You can't afford to do that. You have to be selective. I wish we lived in a matrix-like world where you could say, I need to know how to fly a helicopter. Thanks. And then now you know how to fly a helicopter. It's not how it works. You can't read it all. I have struggled with this. I used to subscribe to a lot of magazines. For those of you that are a little younger, a magazine is basically the internet, except it's like printed out and topic based, and it's like sent to you on a regular basis. It, it's kind of fascinating. So I used to subscribe to a lot of magazines, and I've I've slowly at this point let every almost every one of my magazine subscriptions lapse because I just wasn't reading them. They were stacking up on this island in my kitchen, and every so often I would walk by the pile. The pile would topple over. My wife would give me a glance that suggests now is an excellent opportunity to go through my pile. And I would put the vast majority of those magazines directly into the recycling bin. They weren't relevant anymore. They were newsy. There, there's one magazine in particular that I'm fairly certain I subscribed to for almost 20 years. Fantastic magazine, great writing, great articles. And when like the third renewal notice came, my wife's like, are you sure? And I'm like, yeah, it's okay. I've got a year's worth right there. If I haven't taken a time in the last year to read one, probably not going to. The reality is you're going to miss almost everything that gets produced. Sorry, it's just the nature of the beast. You know, and I have struggled with this because I worried, but I'm going to miss something important. Here's the thing. If it's a big enough deal, you're going to hear about it. It will bubble up into your consciousness. There's just no getting around it. You know, there's a pretty good chance, no matter how you feel about the Apple ecosystem, that you're aware that Apple came out with a new pro computer that if you check enough boxes, it has a decent chance that it's going to cost more than your car. And, and I'm pretty certain this thing can have a crazy amount of RAM. I, I, I want to say it's like four terabytes or some nuts number like that. And you start to think, you know, I'm old enough to remember when having like 32 meg was considered kind of a big deal. You know, and now we just, you have a phone that only has like eight and you're like, oh my God, I can't believe my phone has so little RAM. So you're going to learn about these things. You know, you might be a day late, a week late, but it's going to bubble into your consciousness in some way, shape, or form. The other thing to keep in mind is you can't adopt everything that comes out. I'm sorry. That way lies madness. And so the challenge for us, again, as technologists is, well, how do I know where to spend my time? Now, some people would say, ah, I've got an instinct for this. I've got what Paul Graham calls the hacker's radar. And in fairness to Paul, he actually has a lot of very good criteria in this particular article. I, I think it's about 20-ish years old. I don't remember exactly when he wrote it. But he laid out a lot of interesting criteria that he looks at. And of course, those of you aren't, don't know who Paul Graham is, he's relatively famous in our space. Uh, you know, He's incubated a bunch of, of companies. He sold a successful company to Yahoo for enough money that you know he gets to pontificate now. You know, so successful, I think, by pretty much any, any definition. And so he wrote this piece. 
And towards the end of it, he says, I have a hunch that Java won't be a very successful language. Now, we sit here in 2020 looking back with, haha, 2020 hindsight, and we can say, how silly. Of course, Java has been a successful language. We can have a very fascinating conversation about where is Java in the list of top five most successful languages of all time. I would love to have that conversation, ideally with a beverage in hand. Now, Paul did go on to say, hey, I've never written any Java, but I looked at some books and that told me everything I need to know. So that might not be enough for most of us, but I will admit that judging covers can be a very useful filter. So many, many years ago, someone in my organization decided what we really needed was a WYSIWYG drag and drop BPM tool. And I was apprehensive to say the least, partially because at the first like training thing they sent us to, the representative of the vendor came up and said, oh, the best thing about our product is you don't need any programmers. And he said this to a room full of programmers. And I thought, read the room, friend. But, you know, nevertheless, we still used it and, and away we go. And, and I was talking with one of my colleagues who thought it was a great tool. And I asked him a few pointed questions when I said, well, hang on here, my friend. How do you do a diff? He said, what do you mean? I said, well, this is all WYSIWYG, drag and drop. How do you do a diff? How do you tell what I changed? How do I tell what you changed? And he kind of furrowed his brow and said, well, gee, that's a good question. Uh, oh, I would take a screenshot and then I could do a visual comparison. I thought, Ooh, that's not great. And I said, okay, well, riddle me this, friend. How do you write an automated unit test for this? They said, oh, Nate, that's the best part. Because of the guardrails, you can't make a mistake. You, you don't need tests. And I'm like, all right, that's it. I'm out. I'm done. I'm good. Moving on. We have to be careful for bias, though. That does creep in for all of us. You know, let, let's pick on JavaScript. I'm sure every one of us has had a bad experience with JavaScript at some point in our career. It might have been five years ago. It might have been two years ago. It might have been yesterday. We have to be careful that we don't take a bad experience from the past and let it color all future interactions to say, ah, it's terrible. Yeah, but it might have changed. It might have evolved. JavaScript has improved remarkably from when I first started playing with it more years ago than I care to admit. We want to think a bit about the community. Where are my people at? But we have to be very cautious that we're not falling prey to the lemming effect. I've seen this far too often. New thing comes out, we all jump off the cliff because, well, I read the white paper where Company X used it very successfully. Great. Do you have the same constraints? Do you have the same forces working on you? Or is it a completely different situation? Are you skating where the puck was? See, and I appreciate that you are all in Denver, home to, I, I, should, I, I shudder to say this as a Minnesotan, but I'm a huge Avalanche fan. I love the fact that I can use this analogy. There's some places where I use this and people just stare at me like, but what's hockey? I don't understand. Puck? What? I have to admit, I've been so starved for sports content that in the like sort of early evenings, NBC Sports has been playing old hockey games and I've actually watched some of those, which I don't know why, because I don't particularly enjoy watching hockey on TV. It's much more fun in person. So we have to be careful we're not skating to where the puck was. I'm a huge fan of the technology radar. This comes out of ThoughtWorks periodically, two or three times a year, plus or minus. Every time one of these comes out, there's always something new and interesting that sort of catches my eye. Oh, that's ready for prime time. Oh, it's not quite ready for prime time. Oh, I hadn't heard of that yet. Let me see. Let me, let me bump that up on my personal list. I am sad that Google's 20% time has largely gone the way of the dodo bird i think having this relief valve for developers is fantastic you know and, and i realize it's a hard ask for a lot of us to say give me a day a week to scratch my own itches but to have an opportunity to play with that thing to see if it's useful to me is invaluable in a corporation better to do that on a side project that turns out to not be useful than oh well this project failed but i still got to use language x and so that makes me feel good now, maybe Innovation Fridays is sort of the compromise. And so it isn't every Friday. Maybe it's one Friday a month. Maybe it's every other month. Maybe it's quarterly. But you give people a regular cadence to play and try and experiment. Maybe even all day Friday is too much to ask. Maybe it's Friday afternoon. Maybe you have to start small and let it grow. I remember my previous company, the first time we did a hackathon, well, we couldn't call it a hackathon because that scared people. So we had to call it something else. I can't remember what terminology they ended up using. But the first time it was very much, oh, no, 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 we can't do this. This is crazy talk. And, you know, it was over a weekend. I think it was like a Saturday or something like that. And the results coming out of it were so positive that when we did it again the next year, customers were demanding to be part of it. And since they wanted to be part of it, 
it couldn't be on a weekend anymore. So it got shifted to the week. And the last time I participated in it, it was a week long. And it was a whole bunch of us in a giant room building some Alexa skill stuff. It was fantastic. It was a lot of fun. You know, so it, it was a really you know interesting way of sort of getting that idea out there and allowing us to experiment, try new things and, and, and see if it was useful or not. I'm a huge believer in regular tech talk series, lunch and learns. I had someone say, we call them chew and spews. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Lunch and learn will work just fine. Thank you very much. A friend of mine actually calls these architectural briefings. Now, it's just a formal way of saying, you know, go do some research, present it back to the team, and you don't have to be an architect to do one of these. But it gets us into this whole mindset of like, why should we use this technology? What do you need to know in order to answer the why? What do you need to know in order to use this thing? This does not need to be a four-hour workshop. This should be relatively short, a half hour, 45 minutes, an hour at the tops. It's not the deep dive how-to, but we would like to get beyond Hello World. This has to be two-way traffic, though. This should be a participatory event. We want attendees taking notes, being active participants, asking good questions, bringing their own experience to bear. Do you agree? Do you disagree? And by the way, you should do one of these in the future. Now, if we get past the briefing, it's time to do a little hands-on work. It's time to workshop it. Now, I want to stress, if you're going to do this kind of work, it may be useful to do it inside the constraints of your own environment. So don't be afraid to fork your repo and do something within there. I had an attendee, this was last year, he was telling me that his company had kind of hit this inflection point. They needed a new UI technology. And so, you know, they they surveyed the field and they had three or four that they really liked. And so they went off individually and did kind of some greenfield proof of concept work. And they came back and they kind of settled on one. And he admitted that they kind of got caught up in the hype a little bit. And they thought they could just sprinkle it into their existing app, no problem. Well, then they started rolling it out and realized six months later, they were basically going to have to re-architect their system from the ground up in order to use this UI technology. They couldn't just sprinkle it in. Now, I'm fairly confident that had they done their proof of concept work within some of those constraints, within a fork of that repo, they would have known that earlier. And it may have changed their decision entirely. Instead, they're in a position, when I spoke to him at least, that they were going to have to revisit that and potentially throw away six months worth of work. That's not great. So don't be afraid to do this within the confines of your world. Give yourself a couple hours. You're never going to have enough time, by the way. I had somebody ask me last year, should I use React or should I use Angular? And so my, my, my smarmy answer to this is, well, the best way to figure this out is write the application using React and then write it again using Angular and then throw away the one you don't like. No one's ever going to give you the time to do that. Sorry. It'd be nice. It's the best way to figure it out, but that's not going to happen. You're never going to have enough time. You might get a couple of days. You might maybe get a week or two. So you have to prioritize. What are the architecturally significant things? What are the things you have to prove you have to know about this thing? So give yourself a few exercises, try to focus on the how-to, not so much the setup side of this. If we get past the hands-on filter, it's time to trial it in the organization. We're looking for a real project. That's a good fit. This is not time to square peg, round hole, hand me my bigger hammer, please. So it should be a good fit, but we want to see what happens when the rubber meets the road. It, you know, Proof of concept work is great. I love proof of concept work, but it's not... It's, it's not going to show us where the edges of the map are. It's not going to show us where the dragons are. We actually have to get our hands dirty with some real work, with some real accountability on it to actually see what's going to come out the other end. You rarely want to do this on the bet the company project, though. This should be the kind of thing that if it goes sideways, it's not going to be the end of the world. Now, as much as we sort of intuitively focus on the new, we have to make sure we understand currency is a real problem for us. You know, the bugs that are happening now are getting deeper and deeper. These hacks are, are larger and larger, and the ramifications are huge. I was actually talking to someone earlier this year who said even having Equifax on your resume can be a discussion point, I guess would be the polite way to put it in an interview, which is fascinating to me. Now, amazingly, even though we have known for a long time that the Equifax hack is bad, it's still being used by a lot of companies, which is unfortunate. Now, of course, Equifax isn't even the largest hack ever anymore. They got shoved aside by Exactus and then, you know, Starwood slash Marriott said, ha ha, hold my beer. 
and there you go. You know, there's a pretty good chance all of our data has been spread all over the the dark web. I have a friend of mine who's a kind of a security guy, and I was talking to him last summer, actually in Denver, uh, incidentally enough. And I said, you know, Aaron, is there any chance my information is not all over the dark web? And he just laughed and he said, no. Do you want to go look for it? And I'm like, no, no, I don't, I don't want to know about the parts of the Internet that he has to deal with. Now, I know a lot of folks are like, oh, I'm not a target. I'm not interesting. Yeah, guess what? You are. This map was taken down at some point, which is unfortunate because it was a really good way of waking up if you didn't have access to any espresso. And it showed real time attacks that were happening throughout the world. And it's kind of terrifying as a technologist because, of course, our adversaries only need to be right once. We need to be right every time. And, you know, our adversaries are just these little velociraptors looking for unlocked doors. And, and so we need to be very keenly aware of that. And we can't afford to just, you know, hope nothing bad happens, cross our fingers, you know, security through obscurity. It, it just doesn't work anymore. And, and that's part of why Justin Smith wrote this piece, the three R's of enterprise security, rotate, repay, repair. And, and Justin argues that if you want to stay safe, you have to go fast. You have to starve your attackers of the resources they need to grow. And so don't pour concrete over your infrastructure. It needs to constantly be evolving and changing. You know, we have customers that are nuking and paving their data center every few days. A friend of mine is telling me at his organization, they destroy and recreate app instances roughly every hour. You know, the theory being if somebody gets in, how far can they get in an hour? So do you have a patching strategy? What's that look like? Do you even know what version of a thing you're on? Now, a lot of companies have a policy. It's easy to have a policy. You know, most places I've worked, you're supposed to be at N or N minus one. Well, that's easy enough to say. Do you measure it? Do you enforce it? And this is largely a cultural issue. There's no getting around it. But what do you do about it? And of course, you have to ask yourself, like, what hurts worse? Like changing your patching strategy, getting people to buy into it, or being the next largest hack ever? Of course, anytime we're going to evaluate something, we have to think about the pros and the cons. Because the reality is that every technology decision we make has trade-offs. There is no such thing as an easy choice. If, if it was easy, they wouldn't ask us. You know, that's part of being a senior technologist. By the time it gets to our desk, pretty good chance there's no simple answer. There's no easy answer. Or somebody would have made it before they got to us. And by the way, anytime someone says to you, oh my God, this is the greatest thing ever. It solves every problem you've ever had you should immediately look for the trade-offs. This is design in a nutshell. This is architecture in a nutshell. And the hard part for us is it's very easy to say, well, on one hand, we could do this. On the other hand, we could do that. And sort of paraphrase Harry Truman, please, someone give me a one-handed technologist. So should I use React? Should I use Angular? Should we refactor to microservices? Should we be on-prem? Should we be public cloud? The longer I do this, the more convinced I am that there's three answers that work for every question you've ever gotten in computer science. There's 42. That's the geek check to see who's well read. My favorite pattern as an architect is another layer of indirection. But the answer that I have to give almost all the time is it depends. Mark actually has a t-shirt that says it depends. And I, I saw him wearing that today on a conference I was on with him. And I need to text him and ask him where he got it because I clearly need one of these shirts. Now, I've had people get mad at me when I say it depends. They're like, oh, Nate, that's a you know cop out. I never mean it as a way of ending the conversation, by the way. It's a way of beginning the conversation. And if someone says it depends and tries to stop talking, you should immediately ask them, well, what does it depend on? Keep going. Now, of course, the challenge here is in a lot of situations, people are trying to get one answer. This is the one choice. It's not. It's almost always an and, not an or scenario. You're going to use this and that. And the challenge is knowing when to use which one. And balancing those opposing forces, that's art. That's that's the art of being an architect. You know, how do you get the tension right? There is no such thing as a perfect technology. Please don't pretend yours is. You should always be ready to acknowledge the negatives. And, and one of my favorite ways of pulling this out of people, if you come to me with a new thing and you're like, oh my God, Nate, this is amaze balls, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. The first one should be easy. What do you like about it? I'm going to let you in a little secret. I don't really care. I mean, I do because I'm a geek. And so I'm curious, like, well, what's fascinating here? What's what's the new? What's the hype? What's the cool? But it's my follow-up question that I'm really interested in. That's what don't you like about it? You better have an answer to this. There should be something that that you haven't. There should be a rough edge you've run into that you're not pleased about. You know, this is what tells me you've spent enough time with the thing. 
to sort of get past that honeymoon phase. And so what don't you like about it? What's What would you change if you could? So my favorite way of pulling this out of people, and by the way, it works as an interview question. So you come to me, you're an expert on Java, JavaScript, Python, Mongo, Amazon Web Services, doesn't matter. Cool, I'm gonna put you in charge of that project. What would you add? But before you add that new thing, you gotta remove a feature to make space. So what would you do? If I made you the master of Java, what would you do? You better have a good answer to this. That tells me you've worked with it long enough to know where the rough edges are. You know, I, I've, I've done a lot with Keynote, not surprising as someone who's written a book on, present, on how to present. What drives me nuts about Keynote, and in fairness, I have found some of the edge cases in Keynote that most people probably never would. I mean, you've noticed I've already gone through a lot of slides. I, I, I like to joke I get paid by the slide, which is not true. But what drives me nuts about Keynote is to the best of my knowledge, there's no way to include slides in other slide decks. I'm a software person, so I reuse slides. I reuse sections of slides. They, they fit in multiple presentations. And inevitably, I'm stuck with copy paste. And then I go in and start tweaking because of course that's what I do. I was tweaking this deck before I even got on this call. And I realized, oh wait, that was in this deck and that deck. Oh, and I forgot about that other deck until I present it and I see a slide that I didn't expect to see. Or I'm like, wait, where's the slide about? So another way of phrasing this, and I love Kelsey's Twitter stream. This is one of my all time favorites. You haven't mastered a tool until you understand when it should not be used. This is vital for us. We're really good at inventing reasons to use a tool. That part's easy. What separates, I would argue, the sort of senior technologist from the person who's just getting started is the senior technologist knows, no, no, this is not the right place to use that thing, whatever that happens to be. We want to think about how it stacks up to the alternatives. And this is where we can use spreadsheets. I'm not a huge fan of spreadsheets, although ironically enough, my whole life lives in a spreadsheet that my, my boss manages. You put your options across the top. You put your criteria down the left. You can weight the criteria if you want. And now you got to come up with a scale. And so a lot of us, that's going to be one through five. Here's the problem with one through five. Does not matter how many times you say one is good, five is bad, five is good, one is bad. Someone is going to invert your scale. So that's why I tend to use Harvey balls. That's these guys, not filled in, all the way filled in, somewhere in between. Tends to be a little less ambiguous. You know, although I did have somebody try to say, well, wait, maybe I like negative space. So the not filled in at all actually is more, more meaningful than filled in all the way. I think they're being snarky. But this tends to work a lot better than one through five. One of the most egregious things I've ever seen in an architectural evaluation, one of my colleagues invert kept changing his scale throughout his evaluation so in one section one would be good in the next section five would be good and then one would be good again it drove me nuts but it's just another way of saying how closely does this map to the criteria i found it to be very very effective for example this was an analysis i did at one point comparing angular and react you know, they're they're very very close to one another by the way and to be clear you could take the exact same set of criteria i used and come up with a different output you know, and, and I would also like to point out, I would move any one of these a quarter ball and lose no sleep. You know, it, it's very, very subjective. And I know that drives some people nuts. I wish I could give you a formula. There is no such thing. The interesting thing to me is when I did this analysis, Angular very slightly came out on top, but I personally prefer React. You know, so it's it would have been tempting for me to put my thumb on the scale and try to make React come out on top, but that's not appropriate. I need to just let the chips fall where they may and let other people then make the decision they want based on my input. So what should you use for a criteria? How should you weight them? Guess what, that's up to you. You know, I've never had anybody tell me, here's how you should do the evaluation. Just, hey, you're an architect, go do the evaluation. It is possible, it is tempting to put your thumb on the scales to try to get a certain outcome that almost always backfires. Be very, very cautious here. I, the most egregious version of this that I saw happened actually fairly early in my career. I was, I was at an organization. We were, we were at an inflection point. We needed to change our UI technology. You know, this was sort of struts era-ish towards the end of the struts era. And there was no clear next step. Like, what do we use now? And so we, we had this, you know, a bunch of us got in a room for a couple hours and went back and forth, back and forth. And you know, the senior architect said, all right, everybody, you know, we're not getting anywhere. Let's all just go back and, and do some more thinking on it. I'll schedule a meeting for you know a week or two out and we'll come back and reconvene. And 
we came back a week or two later and he proceeded to present his analysis on what we should do. And shockingly, the thing he'd spent the previous meeting advocating for came out on top. No one could have predicted this. Now, one of the most important things for us to do as architects is identify and defend the quality attributes of our software system. And some people call these non-functional requirements. This is what I grew up calling them. And I have switched to quality attributes, largely because a, a peer of mine, a, a gentleman that I considered a mentor, we we're having this conversation one day and he kept calling them quality attributes. I kept calling them non-functional requirements. And I said, hang on, Mark, help me understand this. You call them this. I was taught to call them that. What's the story? He said, well, you know, it's, the term's fine, non-functional requirements, an accurate term. But he said, think about the conversation you're having with your customer. And you come along and say, I want to talk to you about non-functional stuff. Your customer stops listening. They, they want functional stuff. Whereas talking about in terms of quality, uh, that's a conversation they can get behind. What quality do you want? Now, other people call these quality goals, constraints, quality of service goals, cross-functional requirements, the architecturally significant requirements, otherwise known as the illities, because most, not all, end in illity. The challenge for us as architects, senior technologists, principal engineers, lead engineers, tech leads, whatever your title happens to be, our customers tend to be heavily focused on functionality. And that makes sense. That's what they see. And it, we got to get that right, clearly. It goes without saying, but we got to look beyond that. We have to see the bigger picture, the bigger universe. We have to think about the quality attributes or the service level objectives, if you like that better. Now there's any number of quality attributes. I'm sure some of you are already starting to think of some of these as I'm, as I'm talking here. Maintainability, I don't think I've ever looked at a code base and said, oh, I wish this code was harder to maintain. We talk a lot about scalability today, although sometimes this is a red herring. I've seen too many instances where people get really excited about scalability. And then when push comes to shove, you don't really need it. You know, I worked on one project where my entire user population fit on the floor beneath us. I never was going to be in a situation where I had 10,000 concurrent users. I think the absolute upper limit on number of people I might have on the system at any given time was like 300, maybe. That's like the absolute upper limit. So scalability was never going to be a big concern for me. I had other interesting concerns like auditability. We want our software to be reliable. It needs to be secure. It needs to be easy to deploy. I wish more people focused on simplicity. You know, I, for whatever reason, we have a tendency in this industry to almost fetishize complexity. I was at one organization where the, the one of the sort of tech leads was walking me through the code base and he paused at one point and said, you know, it takes a lot of intellectual horsepower to understand our code. And my thought to myself, I did not vocalize this out loud, is that, well, that's a very charitable way of explaining what you have here, but sure, sure, we'll go with that. I care about usability. This has long been one of my, my sort of pet areas. You might care about compatibility, fault tolerance, modularity. The list goes on and on and on. So what quality attributes matter most to you? Well, there's only one answer I can give you, and of course, that's it depends. It depends an awful lot on the kind of software that you build. Now, I spent almost my entire career building enterprise applications, largely enterprise web apps. And so I've had a, just one kind of view on the universe. A number of my grad students over the years have actually been more IoT embedded kind of engineers. And it's really fascinating to see the way they approach the world. In fact, this, this last semester, I think almost half my class was more in the embedded space. And, and the types of constraints they have compared to what I have is remarkable. You know, you get into the fact that they're heavily constrained on resources. You know, the, the bill of materials has already been set. This is how much memory you get. This is how much CPU you get. No, you can't add more. You can't ship like slip your date because the shipping date has already been set. The production line starts on you know June 1st and you gotta be ready to roll. Uh, you know, all sorts of interesting things that I've never had to deal with. And, and of course the challenge for us is I don't get to turn every knob up to 11. What we ultimately have in many situations is an inverse relationship. If I maximize one, I've by definition minimized another. So security and usability are a perfect example of this. I can make the most obscure security approach possible, you know, crazy password requirements that force people to write them down, use a sticky note, put it on their monitor, you know, and oh, look, I've won security, except nobody can remember that. And so hopefully they're using password managers, but most people, they write something down on a little scrap of paper or they, you know, put it in a note on their phone or whatever. And so we have to understand that these things are ultimately a balance and that's our job 
is to balance these appropriately so that we find that right tension in our applications and knowing when do I need to nudge it a little this way, a little that way. Now, another part of the challenge for us is the reality that some of these things are very obvious to our customers. It's a very easy conversation. If we can't support the expected user load, yeah, we can have that conversation. I believe we're at a point now we're talking about these bugs, you know, these, these sort of holes in our software. The reason we need to patch things is a relatively easy conversation. You know, we don't want to be the next largest hack ever. So these tend to be the kind of things that are relatively easy to convince people of. However, there's an awful lot on our space that's, for lack of a better word, invisible. Or if it's not invisible, it's a lot harder to see. So maintainability and simplicity are a perfect example of this. We know we want the code to be more maintainable. We know we want it to be simpler. But how do I sell that to my customers? I, I can't say hey, maintainability is a good thing. They're just looking like, I don't care. I don't have to maintain the code. You know, my, my favorite example of this is actually not about software. My, my old SUV, I took it in one day for service and the service rep said, oh, hey, Nate, we, we have to replace the secondary battery. I'm like, I had no idea there were two batteries. He says, oh yeah, with all the electronic gizmos now, there's a backup battery. And I said, okay, well, how much is it? He's like 90 bucks. I'm like, well, that's amazing. I've been trained that anything in a car automatically is $1,000. And he said, well, it's only 90 bucks for the battery, but the whole thing is closer to 500 because there's a lot of maintenance involved because we have to take the passenger seat out. So it takes about four hours. I'm like, ah, okay. So from my standpoint, I wish it was more maintainable because I would pay less, but by the same token, I'm not the one that's got to do the work. So it doesn't really bother me. So how do I get a decision maker to buy in on things that they can't see? And this is where we have to talk about influence. Influence is one of the most important things you have to have in your architectural toolkit. You know, I, I spend a lot of time talking to people about how to become an architect, what it means to become an architect, how to go from developer to architect. And, and I always like to stress the importance of these these soft skills. You know, a lot of us get very fixated on the technology, on patterns and microservices and server lists and all that kind of stuff. And that's that's fine. That's useful. But where I see most people struggle as they make that transition is the soft skills, the people skills. Because, you know, I've, I've never had a class in my undergraduate or my graduate program on like how to win friends and influence people. But boy, that's pretty darn important when you become an architect. So how do you get other people to do things when you can't order them to do it? So we can start by outlining the benefits. Here's why this is a good thing. Here's why this is in your best interest. We can look for some common ground. You can say, you know, we all agree release weekends got too much, too much drama be nice if it wasn't wasn't so dramatic. I think if we had higher code quality, if we had some of these these automation techniques in place, we had some more unit tests in place, maybe it wouldn't be so, you know, so so angsty. You got to be careful with aggression. I, I have noticed that a lot of us get into these passionate conversations that people outside the project room would call arguments, and there's truth to that. You know, we do argue and we do sometimes do it very passionately. Doesn't mean we dislike each other, we're just having a conversation. Sometimes it's a loud conversation. We need to be good listeners. I suck at this. I'm not going to lie. I'm not great at putting on my listener hat, but but you have to be able to have that conversation. And and that's an important part of it is what, what is this person trying to say to me? What's the real itch here? I will say that's one thing I love about being married to a business analyst. My wife is excellent at saying, hey, what are, what is your actual requirement? Don't solution me. And I cannot tell you how many times I have been going down a path of a solution and I start explaining things to my wife and she says, oh, hang on, you're solutioning again telling your requirements, and she almost inevitably comes up with something that's far more elegant than what I had in my little brain. Now, it's hard to convince people. If you've ever been in a relationship with another human being, you know how hard it is to convince them to do something. There are two basic approaches here. There's the hammer, and there's the ninja. Best way I can describe this is to tell you a couple stories about my family. The first one involves my son. Now, he's a teenager now. And I know he's a teenager because he rarely gets up before 10 o'clock. It's been kind of interesting to see that switch. My friend Chris Judd told me this at one point. His son's a year or two older than Everett. And he told me, oh, yeah, at this age, his biology is going to flip and he's going to start staying up late and he's going to get up late. For the first 10-ish years of my son's life, he woke up at like 6, 7 in the morning without fail. You know, my wife actually at one point when he was younger had a little sign next to his alarm clock that was 7, you know, 7 like the digital clock. And she told him, you can't leave your room 
until this is, says seven, until your alarm clock says seven. You know, and so then he'd come in and hop in our bed and make a bunch of noise and wake mom and dad up. We don't have to worry about that anymore. Now it's <laughs> every so often my wife will look at me and say, hey, wake up the kid. And since his bedroom is now right below the kitchen, I'll stomp around the kitchen. Then that's the way we like to wake him up. And he'll come up the stairs and be like, oh, what's all that noise? And I'll be like, your mom told me to wake you up. So blame her. Anyway, go back to when my boy was much younger. The daycare center that we took him to had a standing policy, thou shalt wash your hands before being released into general population. Any of you that have ever been around children know their personal hygiene is not always the best. They're little walking Petri dishes. They'll stick lots of stuff in their mouth. So to try to tamp down on the spread of illnesses, wash your hands. Good advice today, by the way. Everyone should be washing their hands. I've always been a little bit of a germaphobe. So, you know, this time has been really fascinating for me. So we'd get to the daycare center. be early in the morning. I would have had zero espresso at this point. And I'd look at my young son and I'd say, hey, buddy, please go wash your hands. And my little three-year-old son would look at me and say, no. Now, I don't have the broadest parenting toolkit. And so I'd look at my son and I'd repeat my request a little louder in case he couldn't hear me. I'd remind him of our relationship status in case he forgot overnight. And I'd say, Everett, I'm your father. Go wash your hands. He would just cross his little arms and look at me and say, no, never. Now, I'm getting ready to deploy the foot. I don't know what else to do. And so my wife would step in, proving she's way better at this whole parenting thing than me. And she'd say, hey, buddy, I bet I can get my hands washed before you can. And she'd take one step towards the sink and he'd run over and start washing his hands. Ha ha, mommy, I'm going to beat you. Now, I'll give you another story and also involving my, my lovely family. This was probably six or nine months ago. I was home and, and my wife had made vegetarian quesadillas for dinner. And I said, well, vegetarian quesadillas again? Didn't we like just have this? And she's like, well, you come up with a vegetarian meal then. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, yeah, at least once a week, I, I make a meatless meal. My son and I both looked at each other like, wait, what? And I said, how long have you been doing this? And she said, about a year. And I thought, well, huh, that's pretty fascinating. Now, I assure you, if she had explained her thoughts to certainly my son, I, I'm a little more, I guess, open to vegetables than my son is. He would have said, absolutely not. You know, he's the kind of kid where you ask him what kind of pizza he wants. And he just says all the meats. You know, he, he is a very happy carnivore, to say the least. And, and so had she sort of tried the hammer approach to say, this is what we're going to do, there would have been pushback from the peanut gallery by simply sneaking it in and sort of daring us to notice, which you know, clearly we're not the most observant creatures because we didn't really figure it out for a while. She actually got us to eat healthier. So there you go. The challenge for us in most organizations is finding the influential people. And the org chart, by the way, may not really tell you a lot here, but you're almost never going to have that sort of direct line of sight to the decision makers. You're going to have to influence the influencers, you know, bounce the ball off the wall. This is another one of those really important skills you have to have as an architect. You want to approach these people as equals. You want to rely on the strength of your ideas, the strength of your reputation. By the way, reputation speaks for you when you're not in the room. If you're not sure what your rep is, you should ask. You may not always like the answer, but you can work to change it. Several years ago, I got the reputation as crazy open source guy. And I didn't necessarily think that was a bad thing. And I wasn't really sure why I had that reputation. But at some point, I asked my then boss, I said, hey, you know, Jeff, do I still have that reputation? And he said, well, hang on, Nate, I'll ask. And so a few days later, came back and said, no, no, you seem to have shed that one. Now, I don't know what I did to, to, to earn it. I don't know what I necessarily did to get rid of it, you know, but it's important just to know how you're perceived, especially in the management ranks. You know, I had a colleague of mine who, in his mind, was, was per, passed over for a promotion. And he asked our former manager, hey, was I even in the running for this? And our former manager said, well, I hate to say it, but no, your, your name your name didn't even come up. And while that hurt for my friend to hear that, he was also able to look at it and say, okay, well, what do I have to do so the next time this position or a position like it opens up, my name is in the conversation? And then he can take that and say, is that actually something I'm willing to do or not? And maybe it is, maybe it isn't. We want to look for common ground. We want to understand that reciprocity is your friend. Be helpful, volunteer, be respectful. I shouldn't even have to say this, but it's clear a lot of people somehow skipped kindergarten on their way to being a software engineer. Research your ideas. Don't be afraid to use trusted sources. Don't be afraid to recruit allies. There is nothing wrong with bringing a gun to a knife fight. If you know that someone in your organization is particularly influential, have them sit next to you in a meeting. I mean, assuming someday we ever actually have in-person meetings anymore. 
invite them, have them be part of the conversation. We also need to watch the words we're using. We need to speak the language of the decision makers. We have to watch out for the techno babble. Now, I understand that we're all impressed by jargon. Jargon's how you know who's in the club and who's not. It's how you know if somebody really understands something. You know, it, you know, I can make a golf phrase, and you know, if you get it, you know, ah, oh, you're you're one of my people. If you're not, like, oh, okay, you're not in the in the club, as it were. But we got to understand that that a lot of customers they they don't care about this stuff. You know, for most of our customers, spring is a season. It's not a Java framework. They're like, what's that? What's that all about? So you got to ask yourself, what resonates most in your organization? Is it cost savings? Is it develop productivity? Is it speed to market? Don't be afraid to shape your approach accordingly. Now, I'm going to walk you through a kata to show you one of the ways you can kind of find these quality attributes. And and I every time I do this, I think to myself, I really need to send this to Neil so he can add to the site. I actually have another one I need to send him to. So I'm a big fan of self-driving cars. I hate driving cars. I Anytime I can, I try to get my wife to drive because I just don't like doing it. You know, it's actually one, another, I guess, silver lining of this whole pandemic thing is I hardly put any miles on my car anymore. It's really interesting. I, I couldn't even tell you the last time I gassed up. It's, it's kind of strange. So we're going to pretend that we've got our answer to self-driving cars. VCs can't give us money fast enough. People are coming to our, our very stylish website. And we've been asked to build a back-end system. So the car is going to generate a bunch of information, you know, battery level, health of the engine, et cetera. And so here's kind of the rough requirements we were given. Well, the car is going to phone home on some cadence. And, you know, we're going to get a standard payload with some kind of identifier. We'll assume it's a VIN for now until we're disabused of that notion. We know there's a lot of demand. We're talking about millions of cars, a lot of ideas coming out of the marketing area. Got to be available 24 by 7. We know there's a customer facing side of this. There's a web interface. There's a mobile interface. We want the owner to be able to check the stats on their car. You know, when does it need maintenance? Does the battery need to be topped up, et cetera? Obviously, it's got to be secure. You don't want just, you know, random people accessing your information. We need the car to come to you. This to me is one of the best things about the whole self driving car concept. It's going to sort of change the way we view cities, even homes for that matter. You know, I've thought a lot about this that. A lot of people, you know, if you live out in the burbs, you probably have a three, maybe even a four car garage. What happens when we only need like one car, you know, because we then sort of short term lease a self driving car? You know, how's that going to look? I, I suspect there's going to be a, a huge uptick in garage renovations at some point in the next 20 years. But I love the idea that the car can drop you off and then pick you up, and the car is going to be nice and warm in the winter, nice and cool in the summer. You know, this, this sounds like a pretty big win. We're going to push a notification for maintenance, battery, et cetera, et cetera. On the company facing side, we know that we generate a lot of information. It's got to be anonymized. We've got to make sure nobody's doing vanity searches. Authorized access. This access has got to be audited. We're going to push updates to the car. Now, as an architect, I'm probably going to, you know, frankly, argue about that one. It doesn't seem like it's orthogonal to the rest of what this system does, you know, but it's very common for someone to say, well, you've already got a link, so we might as well use it. And then we're going to push information to our customers about recalls, updates, et cetera. So what quality attributes matter here? What words or phrases jump out at you? So if we go back to our, our quote unquote requirements here, the first thing you notice is extremely high. Well, that's kind of a weasel word. What do you mean by extremely high? You know, what, what used to be a big number in software is not so big anymore. So we, we'd want to understand this a bit better. Millions of cars. Do we have millions of cars on the road now? Is that an optimistic projection? How many cars are we producing a month? How many cars are we selling a month? What does that really look like? You know, what is, what's, what's a reasonable three-year runway? What's a wildly successful runway? What's a uh, things didn't go so great runway? You know, it doesn't do us any good to build out a whole bunch of stuff we're never going to use. Anytime you see 24 by 7, this has got to get your attention as an architect. You know, it's your little 10 eye should be going up anytime you see that. On the customer facing side, owner checks the stats. You know, we can have an interesting debate about what owner means. You know, what does that look like? Secure, obviously, we don't want just random people to be able to get at this information or to be able to summon the car to them. This is another one where as an architect, we might start saying, yeah, I don't think we want location information. That That's not the kind of thing that, that I feel great about having. There's an increasing awareness that data can be a toxic asset. And once data storage got to be so cheap that your data scientists were like, store everything, we'll figure out how to use it later. The, the knock on effect of that is then you end up having a lot of data that people are going to want. And is that something you really want to be responsible for securing and dealing with? And, and so I think a lot of people now realize that 
you want the bare minimum on data and then get rid of everything else as quickly as possible. We got another weasel word. What do you mean by a lot? You know, what does that actually look like? Authorized is this by ID, by role? You know, what does that look like? And what's our audit requirement? You know, I worked on one system where we had to audit every single change in the system. Who made the change? What was the old value? What was the new value? When did they make the change? Because we needed to be able to run any report on the system as of any date and time. You know, we, we had an event-based system. It just hadn't been invented yet. So I would I would architect that completely differently today than, than what we had 20 years ago. So obviously, auditability, availability, security, usability, these are pretty important things. Now, the next thing I typically do is kind of rank them, try to get a rough idea of what's more important. And, and of course, it does depend a bit on the perspective of the system. If I look at this from the driver owner point of view, it probably looks something like this. I'm not going to read a manual, how to use my car. So usability better be pretty high on the list. It, it better work all the time. You know, it's not, I'm not going to be happy if I press the button and the car says, I'm sorry, I can't come get you right now. Like, uh, no, come get me right now. I don't care if that's one in the afternoon or one in the morning. You, know, you have to come now. It's got to be secure. You know, I got to be confident that that other people don't have access to this. It needs to be reliable. But I would almost argue that's kind of table stakes that, of course, you know, I'm not even going to buy your product if it can't even get past that. Now, we never talked about a service center, but clearly somebody's got to be repairing these things. So what does that look like? Well, it's similar. You know, we want to make sure security is there. Well, this might bump up to the top of the list because I don't want people doing vanity searches. I don't want somebody sort of wandering in off the street and start using our system. It needs to be auditable. We need to make sure that people are using the system appropriately. It's got to be efficient. You know, I, if I can eliminate clicks in eliminate minutes, this is a win for, for both the representative as well as any customers that are also trying to get at this information through the representative. And usability matters, don't get me wrong, because I, I want to make sure that people can use the system quickly and easily. But because these are my own people, I can take them off the line for a few days and train them if I have to. And for better or worse, they're probably going to figure the system out if they have to use it all day, every day. Again, I'm not arguing it doesn't matter. It's just that if I have to balance one off the other, security is going to be a higher priority here than usability. So I can take that a step further and then ask, well, what architectural decisions fall out of that? And so I get something that looks a little bit like this. I mean, have my UX designers engaged to make sure that the design we come up with has minimal training needs. We're going to use geographically dispersed data centers and use zero downtime deploys. Now, we may not know how to do that yet. That might be something I, as an architect, have to spend a significant amount of time figuring out. And if we don't have a public cloud provider yet, this could take me months to work through procurement and legal and everything else that goes into which provider are we going to leverage and what does that look like? Security, we're going to use our standard security approach. We're going to encrypt personal identifiable information. Reliability, look at that. Geographically dispersed data centers, we already get that from availability. Yay, the system works. Now, anytime I, I put together something like this, I always like to stress that the point of making a table like this, I know some people actually use like mind maps. It doesn't matter how you put it together. The whole point here is to have something you can show other people, you know, your peers, the other stakeholders, and get feedback. What did I miss? You know, what do you think? Would you move something up or down? You know, it, it's not to get it right the first time. You're never going to do that. You know, these don't spring forth from your head fully formed as if Athena. The goal is to have something you can have a conversation around. I mean, that's every architectural artifact ever created. Let's have something we can have a conversation around. So that's quality attributes. And, and that to me is one of the most important things that we do as architects. The last thing I want to touch on here is principles and fitness functions. Now, as an architect, one of the first things you realize when you get the job is, boy, I've spread really thin. You know, I, I remember one of my first architects, I thought, he's not a very good architect because I hardly ever see the guy. And then I became an architect and had like seven projects dropped on my head the next morning and realized, oh, we're just spread really thin. I've never been in an organization where the architects are all sitting around drinking coffee going, we're super bored, we have nothing to do. It's all, my God, we can't find enough people to do this. We need more architects. How do we grow architects? Now, the reality is I don't want to be involved in every decision. I don't want to be the bottleneck. I don't want to be the single point of failure. So my challenge as an architect is to establish principles or guardrails or guideposts or North Stars for my project teams. I want to create the environment within which our projects can thrive. Now, of course, the challenge for me is to know are people following those principles? And that's where we get into this notion of fitness functions. 
Now, every one of us is familiar with the second law of thermodynamics, otherwise known as the teenager's bedroom. Earlier this year, I either had to put something in my son's room or get something from my son's room, and, and I had a hard time figuring out where the floor was. And so I made a comment to my wife. I said, oh, we should probably have the kiddo clean up his room. And she just looked at me and said, what hill do you want to die on tonight? And I quickly realized, not that one. So the universe wants to be disordered. As much as I wish my son's room was a little more organized, I understand that he's just dealing with the natural law of the world. And our software is not immune to that. You know, every one of us has started on a new Greenfield project thinking, aha, this time we're going to do it right. You know, I finally have the opportunity. And then three months later, six months later, you've crossed the streams and the packages are all out of whack and you're just pulling out your hair going, my God, what happened? You know, and as an architect, we go through this time and effort to establish the architecture. We don't spend a lot of time asking how are we going to maintain it? Because I can't spend every minute of every day on every project, but I need them to make good decisions. And of course, I can't predict the future. You know, the only thing I can do is study history and history tells me I can't predict the future. Now, I think you should all know at this point, that's not entirely true. I do know things are going to change. That's pretty obvious, which does seem to be in a bit of contrast because architecture is typically defined as those decisions that are hard to change, the decisions we wish we got right. But how do I balance that against the fact that I know things will change? Doesn't that mean architecture and agility don't go together? that I can't be agile and have architects. And, and I've heard that phrase a lot. Oh, we don't have architects, we're agile. And I always laugh when I hear this. Sometimes I do it out loud. Sometimes I do it in my head. Depends how disciplined I am. Here's the reality. You have people making architectural decisions. Doesn't matter what their titles are. I sure hope they're making good ones. Don't worry, you'll know in a year or two. This is how you end up with four different UI frameworks baked in your application. But, you know, we don't have architects. That's actually the individual who told me that story said, we don't have architects. That's why I'm here. I'm trying to learn how to be an architect. So what do we do about that? Well, maybe we need to change our assumptions. Maybe we need to follow Martin's advice. You know, he's a pretty smart dude. Build for now. Choose technologies that can evolve, evolve one use case at a time. This is the core tenet of evolutionary architecture. Build an architecture that expects change. That's what Neil, Rebecca, and Patrick were talking about. An evolutionary architecture supports guided incremental change. Now, obviously, some architectures are more evolvable than others. You've probably worked on a system whose call tree resembled this. But maybe we change our approach. Maybe we deploy components and we turn features on and off via toggles. We change incrementally. We actually use hypothesis-driven development. But how do I know if the architecture meets our needs? How do I know if some refactoring, some new design choice, some new feature violates some part of the architecture? That's where fitness com functions comes from. This comes right out of evolutionary computing. Take the algorithm, mutate it. Is that mutation a success? Are we closer to or further from our goals? As architects, this is all about protecting the illities and balancing those trade-offs. So I can actually use this as a way of capturing and preserving those key architectural characteristics that I care about on this project. So I need to identify them first. You might call these service level indicators. So we have a tendency to default to what would you say we can measure? Be very careful here. Just because you can measure it doesn't mean it matters. Anybody wanna have a debate about lines of code? Once we have metrics, we can start to set some goals. You might call these service level objectives. By the way, a service level objective is not the same as a service level agreement. The agreement is important. If there is no consequence to you failing to meet that, that objective, then it's an objective, not an agreement. Now I can create fitness functions, which is in a nutshell, a set of tests that we execute to validate our architecture to say, hey, how closely does this particular design get us to our objectives? Now, obviously, in a perfect world, these are all automated. They live within our deployment pipeline. There's probably still going to be some manual verifications at various points. You know, human beings are still part of the process. So we might look at this and say, hey, I want all service calls to respond within 100 milliseconds. I don't want the cyclomatic complexity to exceed, ex to exceed a small single digit number. That's just how many paths do I have through the code base? Probably don't want any cyclic dependencies. I might care about directionality of imports. Maybe I've got a really young team and I want to make sure that they understand it's perfectly okay if util gets included in a persistence in web, but please don't go the other way. If you include web into util, I might fail the build. We might use consumer-driven contracts. We might lose some, use something like Spring Cloud Contract to actually figure out, hey, am I violating some expectation of someone who uses my API? 
There is Arc Unit, which you can actually use to unit test your Java architectures. There is a .NET variant of it. Uh, there's a whole set of suite of tools that are starting to come around, like scientists and whatnot, to help us with these kinds of things. You know, you might look at performance. You might look at average maximum response time. You might look at what happens as you ramp up the number of users, the number of requests. You might look at number of timeouts, number of application faults. Uh, you might care when you tick over to the next pricing tier with your cloud provider. You probably want to make sure that if there's a hard failure of an application instance, a new one spins up. You want to alert when things start to go out of band. Now, as much as we'd like to think we can figure all this out a priori, you're probably going to have to unleash the Simeon army into your code base. You're probably going to have to rely on a little bit of chaos engineering to figure out where those weird spots are. Human beings are really good at the happy path. We're not so great at the unhappy path. And my favorite way of getting people to think about this is I ask them to describe their morning routine. You know, just jot down what you do in the morning. And it's always interesting to see the different level of detail some people have. Some people are hyper detailed. And, and they're like, I get up at 6.13 and I'm in the shower at 6.15 and I am dressed by 628 and i'm walking out the door at 631 and i'm at my desk at 703 you know and, and other people are all over the map but what i love to do is sort of poke at it and so a lot of times someone will say well i have breakfast and i said well what do you have for breakfast well I, I have toast what do you do if you're out of bread well i have cereal what do you do if you have no bowls that are clean you're out of milk oh why well, is i pick up something on the way to work we as human beings just evolve. We just handle it. It's no big deal. Software can't do that. I need to write all those branches in. So you have to tell me what the system should do. To me, that's one of the huge parts about chaos engineering is stressing our systems in ways that we will not naturally think about. <sighs> all right. Well, I've been rambling for quite a while. I think I'm going to go ahead and stop here. And... I guess, Greg, I'm not sure if there are questions or how we do on questions here, but let me go ahead and stop my screen and share it. Oh, hey, there's Matt. Hi, Matt. Howdy. So we do have a couple questions, and, uh, and we can actually put them up here so people can see them. But one question was from uh, Jim Fox, how to balance the change versus management and recruiters who want someone with 10 years of something made five minutes ago. <laughs> How do we deal with the fact that, hey, I really want to have all this? So, so understand that the people who write a lot of these job descriptions don't really know what they're talking about. I remember when iOS development first started getting kind of interesting and everybody wanted to have iOS developers. I saw a job post that said, must have 10 years of iOS experience. <laughs> and this was right after the App Store opened up. It was impossible to have had 10 years of job experience or iOS experience. So I guess step one, invent time machine, right? Right. <laughs> so it's important to understand what's realistic and what's not. And, and to balance the fact that, yeah, I may not have 15 years of experience with that particular thing, but I've been writing software for a long time. And so I know I know the big outlines and, and, and kind of where those edge cases are. And, and we'll pick up the, the other bits along the way. You know, I, I, I get really irritated when people assume developers can't learn new things. Because of course, developers can learn new things. We, none of us was born knowing how to write Java or Python or Perl. We all had to learn the first language. Right. Now it takes you time to learn to think in that language, you know. But but the, the grammar uh, that for most of us you pick that up pretty quickly, you know. Especially by the time you've learned the fourth, fifth, sixth language, you've got more things to compare it to. You know, it's it's no different than spoken languages that way. You know, so I think part of that is being able to push back and, and just kind of understand that, yes, I'm, I'm an experienced software developer. I know the ins and outs of writing software and I'm rapidly evolving on that. And I'll, I'll, I'll be up to speed pretty quickly. Uh, you know, you just have to maybe educate them a little bit about, does anybody even have 10 years with that? You know, probably not. All right. Okay. So we got another one from Bill Tucker here. Uh, what are some indicators that we need to rewrite the system or part of the system? So that's a great question. Uh, you know, a, a lot of what this boils down to is, do, do you have things that are really hard to evolve and customers ask you to do something and, and we just can't do it, you know, or we can do it, but it's going to take us six weeks or six months. You know, that's a pretty good indicator that something there needs to be fixed. The hard part is knowing, do I need to be, am I looking for kind of the pragmatic quick fix duct tape bailing twine? 
or do I need to invest and, and potentially, and I don't want to use the phrase nuke and pave necessarily, but more work needs to be done here. Like we, we might need to redig the foundation, you know, and, and that's a harder line to see sometimes. And it's very easy to always look for the sort of monkey patch. How can I just sort of glue this on the side? And, and that might be the faster way to do it, at least initially, but there's usually a long-term cost for that. You know, it's very common to see our velocity get slower and slower and slower as a project ages out. And a lot of that's just that that sort of, uh, you know, technical debt we're dragging behind us. So when we reach that point where, boy, we just are really struggling to move forward, it's really hard for us to evolve the application. You know, that's usually a pretty good indicator that, that something has to change. Okay. Well, we got one more from Bill here. What triggers the use of a tool like Alloy or TLA Plus in, in architecture? I'm not sure I'm familiar with those two tools. Uh, Matt, do you know anything about either of those? Does that ring a bell to you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I can't say I'm familiar with that. I'm familiar with the uh, the tool you mentioned. Was it ArcUnit? Yeah. Yeah, we use that in JHipster just to try to you know make sure there aren't we're not crossing boundaries and having services call our web classes and stuff like that. Sure. But yeah. Yeah, I would say just in general, if, if a tool is is helpful then by all means use it, you know, and what you might find helpful on one project might not be helpful on another. And, and some of that's driven by your team too. You know, if you've got a bunch of really experienced developers that, that have been working on the same project, same domain for 10, 15 years, they might not need that same level of proverbial handholding. You, know, you might give them a freer reign. If you've got a bunch of people who are right out of college, have never worked on a system like this before. Yeah, there might be some tighter guardrails in place. All right. All right. Well, that was all our questions. So I think we can call it an evening and let you get back to your family and enjoy your golfing. Thank you, buddy. It's good seeing you, pal. All right. See you, everyone. Cheers. Bye.